get your shoes on. Go for a walk with me. Let's talk. There's so many things going on. I normally walk in the morning, but today it was a little chilly. And uh, right now the temperature is like really, really nice. So I figured, why the heck not? Let's do an afternoon walk. There's a lot of good college football games on this weekend. And hopefully your team, whoever you're rooting for, is winning. Guys, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but the other day, uh, Yahya Sinwar, who I believe was the leader of Hamas, they showed a situation where one of the IDF forces had a drone that literally drove into the little apartment area where Yahya Sinwar was. And apparently the last thing Yahya Sinwar did was threw a stick at this drone. You might have seen footage of this. And a couple minutes later or a couple hours later, they confirmed that Yahya Sinwar was no more. They went ahead and eliminated him. So come to find out that the Hezbollah uh, leaders decided to go ahead and throw some or send some drones out to Israel. Apparently drones have uh, an easier time getting past the uh, Iron Dome of Israel. I don't know if it's because maybe they fly a little bit lower and slower than traditional uh, ICBMs. But whatever the reason, these drones are able to get by the Iron Dome defense much easier. So anyway, long story short, apparently Bibi Netanyahu, the president of Israel, apparently he has multiple homes, but apparently one of these drones made it to the home and banged into his house, causing some destruction. Now, apparently uh, Bibi was at another home all, all together with his, with his family members, but it was still kind of creepy because I don't know if you guys remember this, but a couple months back, they foiled an assassination attempt on former President Trump. And apparently the assassination attempt was from Iran and apparent or, or started in Iran. It was ordered from the Iranians. And apparently these drones that Hezbollah used to go after Bibi Netanyahu, apparently they were Iranian drones. So I find that extremely interesting, but extremely uh, unsettling and disturbing. Because what it tells me, and I think we've all call, kind of already assumed this, what it tells me is that we're probably already into the, in, in the midst of World War III. And whoever is our future president, whether it be Trump or whether it be Vice President Harris, I think they're going to probably have a hard time going through all four years of their term without uh, potentially having an assassination attempt. Do we want that to happen? Of course not. And we hope that the Secret Service gets up to snuff so that they can make sure those things don't happen. But Netanyahu had an assassination attempt. President Trump had an assassination attempt. A lot of our weapons, when we go after leaders of Hezbollah and this, that, and the other, we get them, we, we assassinate them, so to speak, right? Or we kind of sit back and watch while our allies do, right? And what it equates to is a situation where it looks like they have no trouble finding out where you live. And it looks like they have no trouble finding a way to at least try to take you out. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but they said that in President Trump's uh, circumstance, if he doesn't move his head slightly the last second, he probably would have been taken out as well. So I think a lot of people are under the assumption that if you take out the head of the snake, the rest of the body perishes, but reality has kind of shown us that it's different. Apparently most countries, and I'm assuming even Hamas and Hezbollah, they seem to kind of keep on going whether you take out their leader or not. So ceremoniously, yeah, it does look like you're really kicking butt, but the reality is even if you were to take out one of our presidents or one of their leaders, you know, we're gonna have somebody ready to replace that leader anyway. I would love to know your guys' thoughts on this because here's the thing. I would imagine that as a leader of a country like Israel or a leader of America like the president is, right? I would imagine that you have very little fear of being taken out. And if you were taken out, I'd imagine most of us imagine being taken out by our own people for their own causes. You don't really imagine people taking you out from another country altogether. But if they're capable of doing that now, which it very much looks like they are, 
wow, that's a, that's a scary thing. That just goes to show you that in the future, you're gonna have to have more on your side to potentially get away with being a president of any country. You're gonna have to have some kahunis and some guts, and you're probably gonna have to start wearing a bulletproof vest everywhere you go. I remember uh, the Pope visited uh, Arizona, God, I wanna say like 30 years ago, and he went to, uh, I believe, Sun Devil Stadium. Kind of ironic, huh? But uh, I remember that he was in some sort of vehicle that had bulletproof glass on all four sides, so he was able to wave at people safely, right? But it must be really challenging being the leader, whether it be the leader of the Catholic Church, leader of the uh, United States of America, leader of Israel, or even the leader of Hamas or Hezbollah. It must be very stressful. You must have to constantly look where you're going. You constantly have to have a team watching where you're gonna be, making sure nobody's scouting out the area ready to take you out. You need the CIA and Secret Service to make sure that they're watching, to make sure nobody's trying to find your location. Seems really kind of detailed and really kind of freaky. With that being said, let's see what happens and we'll keep track of this going forward. I, I wanna paint a picture for you. This was a story I heard out of Bozeman, Montana, and I thought it was incredibly fascinating, but at the same time sad because it involves somebody losing their life. Jillian Price is the sister of Dustin Gerson. He decided to go camping with a friend in a place called Moose Creek, Montana. His friend ended up calling his sister and asking where he was because apparently even though they were supposed to meet up there close to the place where they were camping, apparently Dustin never made it. So he ends up going down to the place where they were supposed to meet and he finds Dustin's tent and he opens up the tent and apparently he found his friend's body in such a state that he assumed that some sort of brown bear had attacked his friend. When the authorities went to uh, investigate, they found out that it wasn't a brown bear at all he had been hacked by something, whether it be a meat cleaver or a machete, but either way, he was hacked to a grotesque state. Now, here's the thing that I find interesting. Apparently, they're still trying to find some more clues to find out who did this. But what I find interesting is that you would think that if you went to go see your friend at a tent where you were supposed to meet, and you would, at a campsite, excuse me, in the tent, and you would think that you would be able to kind of notice the difference between somebody getting chopped to death by uh, meat cleavers and saws or whatever, right? You think you'd be able to tell the difference between that and somebody being half eaten by a bear. So I know that uh, obviously you don't really come across, you know, dead bodies all the time, but I would imagine that's where uh, that's where you'd have to kind of use your clues. You know, number one was the tent zipped up. If it was zipped up, there's no way a bear could get in there and then zip up the tent, right? Was the tent shredded like you would anticipate it to be if, if it was a true bear attack? I don't know. All I know is a lot of times they end up finding out that the uh, person who ended up taking out somebody was a lot of times that friend. Now, I'm not saying it was the friend at all, but what I'm saying is, what would you think of that? You're supposed to meet up with a buddy. The buddy never shows up. You call the family members, letting them know that, hey, where's Dustin? And pretty soon they convince you to go to the campsite despite Dustin not reaching you. And so you decide to do your own little investigation. You drive up to Moose Creek, you end up finding your buddy's tent. You end up finding him totally mutilated in there. Do you think you'd be able to notice the difference between somebody getting chopped up by a weapon and somebody being taken out by a bear? I have a feeling that if a bear bit you, you would have very uneven wounds. And I have a feeling if a meat cleaver or some sort of a machete hit you, I have a feeling you'd have a lot of straight edged, you know, wounds. Does that make sense? So I find that really fascinating, but here's the thing. If his friend took him out, then you, you gotta really start looking at your friends differently. <laughs> Why do friends take out friends? You know, they say that whenever somebody meets their demise, a lot of times it's from a friend or family member. So when we're thinking about the enemy out there, right? A lot of times there's actually an enemy 
within, somebody that's already in your friendship circle. Those things happen all the time. Horrible thing to happen, by the way, but at the same time, let's be honest, how many times is a woman taken out and you find out it's her husband or her ex-husband or a coworker? And same thing on the other side, a guy gets taken out and you find out it's a wife that did it or an ex-wife or the husband of the ex-wife. Always seems to happen that way, doesn't it? And even when you see these uh, gang-related murders on TV, a lot of times they go deeper than just the surface level. A lot of times you end up finding out that there was some revenge or some, some sort of motive involved that was more than just a random shooting. But a lot of times there's so many stories out there that you lose track of them. So it's really easy to become short-sighted and just say, ah, it's bad people doing bad things. Sometimes there's some real anger, resentment, and revenge afoot. And uh, in this case, I'm gonna try to follow this story and see if we can get some more answers. My thinking is, why the heck did his friend think it was a bear attack when obviously it wasn't? So that makes me think, was there a chance that whoever did this maybe had some bear fur with him and was throwing it around so it would look weird or suspicious? I have no idea. And where does one come up with bear fur anyway? That's where you'd like to have a bottle of bear piss, huh? Just <laughs> spray the whole area down with bear piss. It's kind of a shame. A lot of people go out and love triangles. What does that have to do with a bear, Jesse? Well, that has actually to do with my next story. Imagine a woman that's actually a lieutenant in the Orange County Sheriff's Department down in Orlando, Florida. Her husband, or I should say soon to be ex-husband, was found cheating uh, on his wife by actually making love to a woman while on duty. He actually was the ex-sergeant of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. He ends up having an argument with his wife, or at least he says so, and he ends up saying that, hey, my wife texted me saying for me to take our two little girls out for a drive that she just uh, couldn't take this anymore. So the cops go to this house, find him giving CPR to his wife, and he basically goes with the story that his wife tried uh, taking herself out, right? Self-inflicted death, so to speak, right? And so what they do is they end up taking a look at the wife's cell phone and conveniently there's a text to, to her work office, the, the sheriff's office, and it basically says, hey, I have food poisoning. I'm not going to be able to make it in today, okay? Which is weird. I, I wouldn't expect anybody in that line of work to call in via text, but whatever. The second text was from the wife's phone to, sergeant's, to the sergeant's phone. And by the way... I didn't even say their names. Golly, Jesse. Well, we're gonna start that over. God, YouTube is just so fucking difficult. Why has everything gotta be so damn difficult? <sighs> God, why did I ever start this damn channel? Holy shit. You know, for a guy that talks about being proactive, you think I would have been able to see how difficult and challenging this would have been. And then every day to think, hey, this is a video that's gonna be good. And then nobody fucking watches it. It's a fucking crying shame. Guys, Orange County Lieutenant Ellie Shea was killed by her husband, ex-sergeant of Orange County Sheriff's Department. His name is Anthony Shea. My neighbors used to be the Shays, which is really kind of interesting. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. He ended up taking his wife's life, but he planted, he made the seed. The... I'm struggling right now because what I do is I take a look at a story and I watch a video on it two or three times. Usually they're three minute news stories, right? And then what I do is I try to put some bullet points on a three by five card. Then I try to speed read it real quick and I try to regurgitate it to people. But you wanna know something? It just becomes damn near impossible. I'm gonna try something new 
right here right now and if it bombs it doesn't matter because nobody watches anyway and if it's great great it'll come across as me talking rather than me trying to remember something I just read guys there's a place called Orange County in Orlando Florida they have a sheriff's office there the sheriff's office has an ex-sergeant named Anthony Shea and his wife is Ellie Shea she was actually a lieutenant for that same sheriff's office a couple days ago, she calls in sick, but instead of calling like most sheriff's uh, employees would, she goes ahead and sends a text in that basically says, hey, I'm not gonna be able to make it today. I'm suffering from a bout of food poisoning. Okay, no big deal other than the fact that it looks weird that you won't pick up the phone and call, but okay, you're out sick. A Couple hours later, the police are called. They head over to the Shea's house where they find Anthony Shea giving CPR to his wife and of course she's in a pool of blood and she has a gunshot wound to the head. He ends up saying that he believed that his uh, wife took her own life. He shows the uh, police the phone. The police can't help but think that the, the, the area looks staged, right? It's supposedly this suicide, but the reality is they think it might be a homicide instead. So doing their due diligence and doing their investigation, they end up taking the wife's phone. They see the text where she called the uh, office via text and said, hey, I'm gonna be out because I got food poisoning. I ate a little something and my tummy's kind of sore, right? Again, you figure those people would call and actually call in sick, which they probably normally would, but okay, we'll go with the text. The next text message is from her to her husband, Anthony. And in this text, Ellie supposedly writes, Anthony, I can't take this anymore. Can you take the two girls out for a drive? I need some space. Something to that effect, right? So apparently he takes his daughters out for a drive. Anyway, a couple hours later, the uh, police department or the sheriff's department arrives at Ellie Shea and Anthony Shea's home. And they find Anthony over Ellie, giving her CPR and of course her head is full of blood, right? There's blood everywhere. And it's a self-inflicted gunshot wound, or at least that's the story that we're, we're given. Anyway, they come to find out that apparently this guy didn't do a very good job, even though he was part of the sheriff's office, right? And so they come to find out that it was actually him that did it. The reason they were going through a divorce, and by the way, they were going through a divorce, is because apparently he got fired or resigned from the sheriff's office Apparently, the Shays were arguing. Why were they arguing, Jesse? Well, apparently, oh my God. Oh my God, this girl lost her head. She's been beheaded. Somebody call the cops. Oh my God, there's her foot detached from her body. Or is that her shoulders? All right, so they're having an argument. Apparently, she wanted to divorce him because of the fact that he was caught cheating while he was a sergeant at the office, while he was on duty, he was actually caught having sex with a co-worker. They were all co-workers. He was the sergeant at Orange County Sheriff's De uh, Department. Ellie, his wife, was the lieutenant. So they were both there working for the sheriff's office. He ends up resigning in scandal because he was caught cheating on his wife with a co-worker. And apparently she wanted a divorce, but you know how those divorces go. They end up losing the house, they end up losing their kids, and for whatever reason, they would rather just eliminate the wife. So apparently they can ride off into the sunset and keep everything, and they know it never works out. But yet, like an endless rerun, they try to take care of their wife anyway, right? So anyway, the police arrive, see that he's giving CPR to a woman that's had her head blown off, and they get suspicious. They read the text messages, realize that the uh, scene is kind of staged, and basically make a long story short, now he's gonna be going to trial, and now these two girls are not only without their mom, but they're also gonna be without their dad as well. Funny how it always works that way, isn't it? Why do people get married if there's even a seed of evil in them? And what I mean is if there's a piece of you that could ever imagine, taking somebody's life, you know, because they want to divorce you or because they want to separate or whatever, then you really shouldn't get married. Because a lot of times they don't want to go through the divorce because they don't want to lose half of their worth or they don't want to lose their kids or this, that, and the other. 
And it's one of those things where it's like, you know what? You're still going to be able to see your kids. You're going to have some sort of visitation. You can still make an argument to get full custody. Are you going to win it? Probably not, especially if you're guilty of adultery. But I mean, sometimes you just have to put your tail between your legs and realize that you kind of lost. And that was the situation with, with uh, Sheriff Anthony Shea, or Sergeant Anthony Shea. The problem is, is a lot of times people don't like to lose. And see, once again, we're dealing with law enforcement. If this guy is willing to you know, cheat on his wife while at work with a coworker, and he's willing to take out his wife when it comes to divorce proceedings, well then what does that mean for people that he was a part of a prosecution before? When this man arrests people, once again, if he arrested me or a family member, I would ask our lawyer to go through every single arrest this guy's ever been a part of and see if you can get that thrown out. Now, Jesse, this doesn't make sense. Half the time you're against the criminal, and the other time you sound like you're for the criminal. Well, number one, the criminal in this case is Sergeant Anthony Shea. And number two, if one of your family members was thrown in the slammer because of this sergeant, who basically is a murderer, is that something that you would be okay with? Or would you demand that the family lawyer see if they can open up an investigation to find out about every single thing this guy ever did. Because see, if you're as crooked as a dog's hind leg, God, I've never been able to say that on camera till now, that was a perfect time. But if you're as crooked as a dog's hind leg, more than likely you're crooked all the time, right? And if you're willing to take out your wife, the mother of your kids, then really you're willing to do just about anything. And if you're not willing to lose, right, the, the house and half of your worth and your kids, if you're not willing to lose that, well, then it sounds to me like you're not willing to lose, period, especially when you consider that I'm sure she made money that she contributed to the marriage. I'm sure whatever house they had was both of their houses. You know, a lot of times when it comes to divorce, the judge will say, hey, let's put the house up for sale and we'll split the properties and let's make it where it's equitable and fair for everybody. But for some reason, when people get divorced, it seems like somebody always wants the full enchilada. And I don't understand that at all. So here's my question for you. If you were walking right next to me, I would say, hey, no one's listening, it's just you and me. Do you think you could ever kill your ex to keep the kids and keep the house? I have a feeling you would probably say, no, I don't think the house and and uh, having full custody of the kids is that super important, you know? And I didn't get the impression by looking at these two, like they were so young that their kids would be like two and five. I'm assuming their kids are probably grade school, maybe even a little older. And you know as well as I do, five or 10 years goes like that. And before you know it, those middle school kids are adults and you're gonna be able to see them as much as you want. Also, if you're cheating on your wife with a coworker, you probably, number one, don't care too much about your wife, and number two, you're probably infatuated with your coworker. So even if you were to win custody of your kids, you're probably gonna be calling the sitter over quite a bit so you can go hang out with your new love interest. What it all boils down to is a situation of why do people get married? And don't get me wrong, you guys know I am pro-marriage. I am pro-people coming together, having kids, raising a family, doing things the right way. Sometimes, as much as I hate to say it, sometimes raising kids the right way includes getting an amicable divorce. Sometimes we grow together, many times we grow apart. And in this situation, it sounds like they probably weren't that much into each other anymore. And even if at one time they were, it's really hard to be interested in somebody when you're going out of your way to cheat on them with someone else. You know, uh, what's that saying in the Bible? Man cannot have two masters. He will serve one and he will despise the other or however it goes, right? That's kind of a reality. If you love your wife, you know, like crazy, and all of a sudden you're cheating on her with someone else, pretty soon your wife's gonna be able to notice that you're not giving her attention anymore. And women, just in case you're getting any ideas, you guys are the same. If you're all of a sudden making love with your husband every night, and all of a sudden it's once a month or once in a blue moon, 
you know, he's obviously going to know something's up. And that's what happens. And I think this is what happens with polygamy. And I think this is what happens when guys have multiple girlfriends or vice versa. You think on the outside, having all these side chicks sounds exciting and fun. And I'm sure at the beginning it might be. But after a while, it's kind of hard to keep track of three or four dating partners. And would you really want to leave the one that you like the most for one that you like third or fourth best? So it's kind of a recipe for disaster because it's just human nature that you're going to want to go out with the one that you really like. And if there's three or four people there, it's very rare that you like all three or four. You're probably going to gravitate towards one. Which, by the way, is the reason that a lot of people end up getting married, right? They say, hey, I don't want to go to the club anymore. I don't want to be on these dating apps. You're the one. And they're like, me? Should I run? Yes, you're the one. And they're like, ah, I'm going to run. But the reality is, what we should do, if you really think about it, and maybe walking helps me come down to earth and think about this reasonably, what we ought to do in this country is we ought to maybe wait a little longer before we get married. Wait until we have a couple of arguments. Make sure that we can recover from those arguments because if every time you guys argue, you want to cheat on her or she wants to cheat on you, well, that might be the perfect reason to just hold off on getting married. And I think we need to be more honest with ourselves. If you're with somebody that you love, but you're not super duper attracted to them, Although you should never marry somebody just for looks, the reality is if you're not super attracted to them but you're still attracted to other people, you probably don't want to get married. It seems to me like Dateline has an endless number of shows to put up about love triangles and people that end up finishing off their significant others. I hope you guys enjoyed this walk with me. Like always, I stumbled over my words. Maybe one day, I'll get this down to a science, but don't hold me to that because I'm human. One of the reasons I'm divorced is because I noticed when I was married, there were moments where I wanted to pull my hair out. But no matter how annoying I thought my spouse was at the time, there was never a time where I thought, I want to end this person's life. And the reality is, even if she would have cheated on me and stuff, which she never did, I would have never wanted to take her life. I hope you guys are having a wonderful weekend. Don't think about taking lives. Think, think about adding time to your life. Enjoy your walk and have a wonderful day. I'll see you tomorrow.